Okay, it is six o'clock, so we're going to get this started. Welcome to this University of Missouri St. Louis speaker series event from UMSL Global. My name is Evie Hemphill, and I'm a producer for our local talk show at St. Louis Public Radio, St. Louis on the Air. Our radio station is a public service of the university, and I'm really glad to be a part of this event tonight. Tonight marks the second in a series of presentations that comprise this year's Dr. Edwin Fetter Lecture on Foreign and International Affairs. Dr. Fetter was the founder of UMSL's international office about 50 years ago, which is now called UMSL Global. This lecture series honors his legacy and seeks to carry on his pattern of bringing good information about the world to the UMSL community and beyond. Dr. Fetter knew how important deep global understanding is for all of us. And in keeping with that search for good information that will deepen our understanding of the world, I'm pleased to introduce several special guests tonight. Our speaker will be Major General Corey J. Martin. He is the Director of Operations at United States Transportation Command. That command is based right here in the St. Louis region at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. But Major General Martin's responsibilities extend internationally. He and his team have played a very key role during the recent evacuation of civilians by the US military in Afghanistan. We're also joined tonight by Liana Constantine. She is the executive director of UMSL Global. And finally, we have with us tonight, UMSL Chancellor Kristen Sobolik. One quick reminder before we get started, we do plan to save some time at the end for audience questions using the Q&A tool uh, following the presentation. So feel free to send those along as you think of them and we'll try to get to lots of questions following the talk. Um, do use the Q&A tool, not the chat box for sending your, your questions. And now without further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Chancellor Sobolik as she welcomes our speaker tonight. Great, thank you so much, Evie. Um, I appreciate that. And I really am uh, sending a welcome to Major General Corey Martin for coming here on this evening to join us to talk about a very timely issue. I'm also pleased that this is hosted by UMSL Global that really does a great job of making sure that we remain um, engaged and focused on all things, not just here in our St. Louis area, but also all around the globe. So thank you a lot, um, Liana, for um, helping host this as well. So welcome to everybody. This is a timely topic, and I'm very excited to hear what uh, Major General Corey Martin has to say. I wanna talk just very briefly about UMSL and talk about our military connection and it all feeds in. But as many of you know, the University of Missouri St. Louis is a young institution. We're 58 years old, 50 years of international education as Bob L's um, background indicates. And we're taking our place as a leader in the region and nationally. We are the premier public research university in Eastern Missouri and Western Illinois. And we're ranked as a tier one national university by US News and World Report. We moved up 42 spots in the US News and World Report's list over the past two years. And we are now ranked number 118th in the nation. But as an institution, we are very engaged with our veteran and military community. And we have a, created a very strong network that is centered around our Veterans Center. In fact, the Military Times has ranked UMSL first in Missouri on its 2021 Best for Vets College list, and we are ranked number 37 nationally. And that indicates seven consecutive years in a row that we have ranked in the top 50 in the nation. So we are very proud of those rankings and in the programming and support structure that we have built for our veteran and military connected students and their families. Um, we're also engaging strongly with the National Geospatial Agency, the NGA, which is expanding here with a new $1.7 million facility, which is termed MGA West. And during the recent NGA INT symposium um, held here in St. Louis last month, I signed an educational partnership agreement, an EPA, with Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, who's director of the NGA, that will expand the work of our geospatial collaborative um, located in T-Rex, right below the Moonshot Labs. 
There are only four institutions in the nation with an APA with the NGA. And that, and we're, we're one of those. And in addition, we have a CRADA, which is the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement with the NGA as well. There's only one higher ed institution in the nation that has both an EPA and a CRADA with the NGA, and that is UMSL. So we have long worked well with veterans and with the military, and we are continuing with our NGA partnerships. We definitely welcome more engagement and collaboration with Scott Air Force Base. And I look forward to talking more with um, you, <laughs> um, Corey Martin, on this and with the rest of our UMSL leadership team. So I hope that you can come to our campus again and take a tour and we can talk about um, increasing our collaborations. So that's a big welcome to, um, to uh, General um, to General Martin, as well as the rest of our community. And with that, I think, I think, do I turn it over? I'll hand it over mm -hmm. back to Evie. <laughs> to me, actually. And oh, thank sorry, you, Liana. Sovalik, in, the, uh, in the interest of time, thank you, Chancellor Sovalik. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce Major General Corey Martin this evening with some highlights of his career that we don't want to miss after the short introductions here before. Major General Martin was commissioned from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1991 with a bachelor's degree of science in aeronautical engineering. He has earned his wings after 12 months of undergraduate pilot training at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. General Martin went on to become a command pilot and racked up over 4,200 impressive flying hours. In addition to conducting combat air drug missions to support our ground troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, he has flown the following aircrafts, the C-17, the C-141, and the C-5 transport aircraft, the KC-135, the KC-10 refueling aircraft, and also the E-3 aircraft that is known as AWACS or the Airborne Warning and Control System. He has even piloted the HH-60 helicopter, and not to forget my, fa uh, actually the helicopter is used for uh, search and rescue and medical evacuation missions, uh, for those who are not familiar with the HH-60 here. Uh, but my favorite aircraft, I don't want to forget, that is the F-15, and of course, General Martin flies the F-15, I guess, passionately from what I can tell. Um, so in addition to that, and especially here as we are, um, as hosts are hosting as a university, um, General Martin has earned a total of four master's degrees on top of his bachelor degree. And on top of all those flying hours and on top of a very busy career. So um, in addition, and by my cal calculations, um, General Martin has moved about 14 times uh, and has deployed two times to Baghdad in Iraq and to Manas, Kyrgyzstan. He served as a defense attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv more recently in Israel for two years before arriving at Scott Air Force Base here in the region in the summer of 2019. For the past 15 months, General Martin has served as the Director of Operations of the United States Transportation Command, U.S. Transcom. In this role, he is focused on transporting people, supplies, and equipment around the world for wartime, peace, and humanitarian operations for the U.S. Department of Defense. Given the global breadth of the United States military, General Martin's job has been very busy during calm times. And it was during his already high operations tempo that he and his team oversaw the evacuation of over 120,000 people from the Kabul International Airport during just two weeks this past August. I could go on and on and on, but in the interest of time, um, let me just say that General Martin, thank you so much for joining us this evening as the second speaker of our FEDER uh, speaker series. The season's theme is helping our local community understand who the Afghan people are that, arriving, that are arriving here in the United States and in the St. Louis area. And I find it outstanding that we have the opportunity to hear directly from someone 
who has played such an impactful and influential role in helping protect so many Afghan people who have supported the United States during the past 20 years. So with no further delay, General Martin, the virtual floor is yours. Well, Liana, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, the part she left out is that uh, Liana and I were neighbors about uh, 10 years ago when we were both in Okinawa, Japan. I think it's one of the wonderful parts of kind of the small world that the military can be. So it's uh, it's great to see her in her new position. So thank you. And for Dr. Sobolik, um, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and I, I uh, commend you for bringing the Federal Lecture Series and to, and to talk about uh, Afghanistan. Um, and really to, to those that are tuning in, thank you for having an interest in, uh, in Afghanistan and all its facets to include uh, many Afghans that will, will be our neighbors in this area soon. I will admit that I did not take much of an interest in Afghanistan before September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, you know, my only recollection prior to that is kind of the Cold War era uh, and knowing that it was known as kind of a, a graveyard for Soviet aviation and, and being a, you know, a, a, a pro U.S. teenager, I, I, uh, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, that the, the Soviets had, had stumbled in Afghanistan, but that's about all I knew about Afghanistan until uh, September 11th, 2001, kind of reintroduced it. Um, and so my uh, my plan tonight is is to just kind of talk about how I have been associated with Afghanistan over that 20 year period. Uh, for for anyone that is maybe probably about 27 years old. Or older, I would guess that you have a, a memory of, of September 11th, 2001. For me, I was about 10 years into my military career at that point, uh, flying the C-17 aircraft, one of the aircraft that Liana had mentioned in Charleston Air Force Base in South Carolina. And the C-17 is a, it's a four-engine large transport aircraft uh, really to deliver uh, soldiers, mainly our Army, anywhere in the world. And we can do that by landing, or we can do that even by just dropping uh, people or equipment out of the airplane while it's still flying. And I had just finished up a week of that training, airdrop training in the C-17 before September 11th. And so that Tuesday was a recovery day for me, a, a day off. And I was uh, on a run in my neighborhood with my wife and with the technology of the day, she had a Walkman on her uh, arm and was listening to music uh, via the radio. And in the course of the run said that a, an airplane had flown into a, a building in New York City. And being a pilot, I tried to picture how that's possible. I imagined very low hanging clouds uh, in New York City, a small a private airplane and a pilot that got lost and ran into a building. So we continued to run, but a few minutes later, she said it happened again. And so we, we went immediately uh, back to our house. And of course, like the rest of the world, when we tuned into the news, we saw just the opposite of the weather. It was a beautiful day in New York City, and it was not a small aircraft. It was a large aircraft, and immediately I knew there was something nefarious that was involved with that. Uh, so I put on my uniform and, and went into went into my squadron. And so there were a couple weeks of time where um, our government was formulating a response. And so that response would manifest itself with Operation Enduring Freedom that began on October 7th of 2001. And it was an opportunity to find the Taliban and Al Qaeda that were in kind of the undergoverned, ungoverned parts of Afghanistan and be able to, uh, to bomb them and strike them. But in the lead up to it, uh, at least according to, to Bob Woodward's book, uh, Bush at War, President Bush said, this is not a war against the people of Afghanistan. It's about the Taliban. And so we needed to find a way to make sure the people of Afghanistan knew it was not against them. And he wanted, uh, in his words, bread to be dropped along with the bombs. And so on that opening night, about, a, about an hour after the first bombs were dropped, I was on the second of two C-17s that were flying formation into Afghanistan to drop humanitarian aid. And, and my, my one prop for the night is just, I'll, I'll show you, it was the packets humanitarian daily rations. Over 30,000 were dropped that night southeast of Kabul, and that mission continued uh, for about two and a half months. But it also just uh, was a start to a new relationship I had with Afghanistan and continuing to fly to places that you've probably heard of, Kandahar, Mazari Sharif, Bagram, Kabul. 
Um, so that was 2001. And it seems like about every 10 years in my career, I had another uh, you know, meaningful interaction with Afghanistan. And so the next was in 2011, when I was a neighbor with, uh, with Liana, I got news that I would command a base that was in Kyrgyzstan, just outside of Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And so I actually, in 2012, uh, went to command that base. That base's focus was twofold. One, it had the C-17 aircraft again, bringing primarily soldiers in and out of Afghanistan. And it also had the KC-135 aircraft that she mentioned, an air refueling airplane about the size of a domestic airline, but with a lot of fuel in its belly and its wings and a rigid hose that it could connect to another airplane. So in flight, it could transfer fuel and that other aircraft could stay airborne longer without having to land. And that was a mission that that uh, daily was flying over Afghanistan with our, with our forces there. And, and then two kind of significant things that happened. And one, uh, you know, a good, happy story, one not so much that I'll just share with you. The one is that during that time, the uh, environment, the, the threat environment in Afghanistan was such that we actually were able to put our KC-135s and eventually land them and keep them in northern uh, Afghanistan and Mazari Sharif. And it was the first time that those aircraft were able to operate from that location on the ground, which was a, a positive thing. Uh, the other I just I need to mention because it, it highlights the sacrifice and the connection many American families have with Afghanistan. And that is that one of our KC-135 aircraft uh, broke apart while it was flying a mission to Afghanistan and, and crashed in Kyrgyzstan, killing uh, the three crew members. And so I just acknowledge uh, those three, two, two men and, and one woman who I just flown with you know, a few days before that accident are three of about 24,000 uh, combat losses that America had in its, in its time in Afghanistan. And so that was in that 10 years in around 2012. And now you go a decade later, we're at uh, 2021. And as mentioned, I'm, I'm at Transportation Command. And, and Transportation Command really is, is, has a global mission that it will deliver our service men and women, our soldiers, our Marines, our sailors, our airmen, uh, soon our, our Space Force guardians, anywhere in the world at the time and place of our nation's leaders choosing. And, and we do that with air, with sea, with land transportation, right? All that is under the purview of transportation command. And so if something has to be there literally overnight, uh, transcom, uh, transportation command aircraft are able uh, to do that. Or if a much larger, what we call a decisive force has to be delivered, uh, transportation command can do that as well. And what that would look like is if you have a, a base maybe like Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, Colorado. If that unit needs to go to Iraq, they first will load up their equipment on rail cars and by train will go to a port, maybe like Beaumont, Texas or Charleston, South Carolina. There, they'll get off the rail and transcom uh, soldiers will load it onto a ship. And these are enormous roll on roll off ships that can carry about 400 C-17s worth of equipment and then make the trip across the Atlantic and into Kuwait. They'll download that equipment and that equipment can drive into uh, Iraq where it is needed. Or if it is needed overnight, an airplane like the C-17 or the C-5 lands at that base, Fort Carson loads up uh, much fewer pieces of equipment, but then can fly it much quicker direct. So it's kind of an ability to do something immediate tonight or a decisive force over time. And in the question and answer, if you have more questions about transportation command, I can, I can discuss that. But in light of that, that is why transportation command was called on uh, to help in Afghanistan this year. And there's really two parts of Afghanistan that I'll talk about. Liana, Liana mentioned the most uh, well-known, and that was the non-combatant evacuation operation. But before that, there was a operation, a retrograde of our forces out of Afghanistan, colloquially called go to zero. And it was President Biden's direction to get our, our combat forces out of Afghanistan. And that happened between uh, April and the end of June of this year. 
Uh, and it took that deliberate piece of transportation command to kind of do the reverse of what I just talked about. 20 years worth of equipment and presence in Afghanistan slowly was brought down to zero. So beyond some of the places I had talked about before, the Kandahars and the, and the Bagrams and the Masri Sharifs, which were fairly large bases, there were many forward operating bases. Those would collapse and they collapsed back onto Bagram. And then eventually on the evening of July 1st, uh, the final C-17 aircrafts left Bagram and had really brought our military presence to Afghanistan to zero. All that was left was the diplomatic presence at uh, Kabul, in the capital of Kabul, and some uh, military security focused on protecting and securing the embassy. And we were able to do that because the international airport, Harman Karzai in Kabul was still operating. And so we would be able to continue to supply our diplomats uh, through that, that airport. But many people thought it was either likely or inevitable that at some point uh, our diplomatic presence uh, might have to leave, mainly because of threats that the Taliban had given to the, the country of Afghanistan and the Afghan National Security Forces. So while many people thought it was likely or inevitable, and we'd been planning for that eventuality, I think you've, you know few people saw it happening at the rate that it did. And so I was not expecting in early August uh, that the non-combatant evacuation operation would begin. But at, at Transcom, where it became very clear to me that it would begin was on Thursday, the 12th of August, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, uh, called to Transcom to make sure that we had the aircraft, we had the air crew, and that we could bring a security force, a combat force, back into Afghanistan that would be sufficient to allow for the evacuation. And once he had that assurances that, uh, that Transportation Command would be able to provide that airlift, the next day on the 13th of August, uh, we begin to flow combat forces back into Afghanistan for that purpose of giving a security uh, of the airfield. Uh, there was an urgency to do that. And I don't know if I fully appreciated the urgency that the, the chairman had at that time, but it became very clear. And if you remember in those, those first days after, around the 15th or the 16th of August, the images that came out of Herman Karzai International of thousands of Afghans uh, being able to access the airfield. Uh, certainly not a safe environment to do uh, to operate aircraft or to try to do an evacuation. Uh, what might be less clear is while the news continued to show some of that that loop footage for days afterwards, really in a in a couple days uh, the situation had changed. The 82nd Airborne, some Marine units had arrived. About 5,000 uh, U.S. forces had arrived. They were soldiers, they were airmen, they were Marines, they were sailors, all on the ground, giving security to the airport so that at that point, the evacuation could start in earnest. And for the U.S. military, it was the C-17 aircraft primarily that was used to, to uh, bring evacuees out. Uh, very challenging environment. We did not know the number of total evacuees. We would show up, there would be thousands that had come through the gates, had been uh, prepped for flight on the aircraft, and we would take them out, and the next day, thousands more, and the next day, thousands more. And there was, we did not know when that stream of individuals would come. But again, there was an urgency to take them out of Afghanistan because of the threat. The Taliban had had quickly uh, taken over Kabul. There was additionally, as you know, a threat from, from ISIS. Uh, and even on the 26th of, of August, you saw the materialization of that ISIS threat with the bombing that happened just outside the gate uh, in Kabul. And so it was imperative to get the, those American citizens, legal permanent residents, those that had been granted special immigrant visas, and Afghans that were at risk because they had aided uh, the United States over 20 years of our time there. Uh, thousands of individuals that had to leave 
in a, in a short period of time. And the C-17 is not meant to be a, really to be a, a people carrier. If you were going to try to move thousands of people out of a location, you would much rather have a, as you're familiar, like a, 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 a Boeing 777 or a 747 that can take three or 400 people at a time out. But the, the security at the airfield did not allow commercial aircraft, a U.S. commercial aircraft to go in. So the C-17 was used. C-17 would normally carry about 100 people out at a time. We can put airline type seats in and get it up, get that number around 150, 170 at a time. Uh, but clearly that was not going to give us the speed, the velocity we needed to bring the thousands of people. It ended up being for transportation command over 80,000 for the entire operation, over 120,000 individuals out. And so what the, the, the C-17 crews did is they just had uh, 400 to 450 people just sit flat on the floor of the aircraft and, uh, and fly them out that way. And there's actually an, a fairly iconic picture, at least in, in military circles, of over 800 people that were on board a C-17 aircraft where it uh, took them uh, to safety. So that was the C-17 part of just getting uh, individuals out of Afghanistan uh, as quickly as possible. It introduced another challenge, though. When you're bringing uh, one day 20,000 people left Kabul, where do you take them? This was a surprise uh, on the timing. And so, as you know, with Afghans that are eventually going to come to St. Louis, there's a, there's a, a journey that took them from Kabul to America. And some of those, we were not ready to take 20,000 a day uh, into America. And so there was some staging bases that were needed. And this is where I, I think it is so important that a country like America has allies and partners, that it has partnerships, global partnerships. And there were several countries, uh, 10 different countries that said, we will take uh, Afghan uh, evacuees and we will uh, allow them to stay in our country for a temporary period of time while we are able to get the flow into America. And so it's, I'm, I'm very appreciative of allies and partners and their contribution uh, to this operation, clearly not just a United States operation. In total, about 30 nations were involved with either uh, bringing their own citizens or other Afghans at risk out of Kabul or helping to host either permanently or temporarily uh, Afghans. Uh, so that one part of the challenge was finding those spaces and, and, and as countries uh, stood up, that was helpful, a bit of a relief valve, a place that we knew that we could bring uh, the evacuees as they left. But then we needed more transportation help. The C-17s at the height of the operation, we, the United States Air Force has over 200 C-17s. On a normal day, maybe 60 or 70 of those are being used. At the height of this operation, well over half of them were being used uh, just for operations that were happening uh, because of the Afghanistan uh, evacuation. And there was still a mission that we had around the world. We still had to continue that mission. Uh, and this is where uh, industry partners, which are critical partners with Transportation Command, these are airlines, some that you, you're very familiar with, American and Delta and United, and some maybe you're not, Omni and Atlas and, and Hawaiian Air, that they uh, made aircraft available to be able to take the evacuees, kind of the last, that last part of the journey into, into America. Um, so anyway, there's, there's much more to the, uh, to the operation, uh, to the point that you're interested in other, uh, details about the operation certainly, uh, can talk about that. Um, but I, I've been in the air force 30 years, uh, I've seen, uh, several operations, many challenging operations. I don't know if I've seen one quite as complex as this one with the number of variables and the number of constraints, um, knowing that there was, a, there was a timeline of when our access to Kabul would end, uh, knowing that there were actors around the airport that wanted to uh, uh, damage U.S. aircraft, U.S. personnel, Afghans that were leaving, um, and then the constraints of, of multiple countries and needing to, to get people all the way back in the United States, a very complex uh, 
situation. And I'm really just uh, able to talk about in all three of those kind of episodes I talked about, the start of Operation Enduring Freedom uh, with the initial airdrops, this, you know, my time kind of in the middle when, when Afghanistan was, uh, was about halfway through our, our war there and at the end about the mobility uh, story. If there was a soldier talking who had spent several years potentially on the ground in Afghanistan, they would have a different uh, uh, pers uh, perspective. If you talk to a, uh, a fighter pilot or a, a bomber pilot that was over Afghanistan and, and dropping bombs, they would have a different uh, perspective. Uh, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to at least give you one perspective to let you know how the U.S. military has been really deeply involved to the point of thousands of lives lost in, in trying to uh, protect the Afghan people. And so as I, as I saw the end uh, at the 20 year point, I reflected a little bit on at the, at the, fir on the first day, a C-17 was bringing that you know, humanitarian aid to the displaced people of Afghanistan and bringing it to them. And then in the end, in the final chapter, it was C-17s that were bringing the Afghan people to the aid. And uh, soon that will be uh, neighbors uh, here in the St. Louis area. And so for those that are uh, local, uh, thank you for what you will do uh, for the, the people of Afghanistan. Um, I would say, uh, ask them their story. Ask them their story of, of how you know, they got to Afghanistan or they're born and raised in Afghanistan. Ask them their story of how they got out of Afghanistan. I know some, some of the Afghans, it was the first time that they had ever been on an airplane when they were put on the floor of a C-17 and, and brought out. Uh, it was a new experience for some of them. There were uh, babies born on the, on the aircraft, uh, uh, babies born in flight on C-17s as they were uh, coming out. There are a lot of stories. So I, I would encourage you, just as I've tried to, to help you understand at least uh, part of the military relationship with Afghanistan with stories that you would uh, allow the, the Afghans to, uh, to do the same. So I think in the, uh, as, I'm, I'm, as I'm looking at the clock, uh, I wanna uh, leave an opportunity for people to ask questions. Again, I can go deeper into any of those areas uh, that, I, that I talked about. The one area I'll say, I, I, I don't work policy. So as far as the policy decisions uh, surrounding uh, Afghanistan, um, I cannot help you with or really speak to in my role as a director of operations. We uh, put that policy into action. Um, so I can, I will be happy to talk about uh, any of that part of, of transportation command or my experiences with Afghanistan. So I think uh, Evie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you or to Liana for uh, question time. Thank you. And as per se, that has been an excellent introduction uh, and opening the floor for us here. Uh, we have, um, just before we start with the questions to give you a feeling who is here tonight. So uh, we have a fantastic audience. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we have a, um, we have one student here, uh, one AMSO student who is from Afghanistan, actually. She joined us last time. So uh, welcome, Hila. Uh, I know you can hear us. Um, we have professors from our university, from other universities, and we have a lot of local people who are interested in the, in the topic. Uh, and as such are the questions here. Before we start reading and relaying the questions out to you, maybe uh, Chancellor Sovulik, I wanted to promise you to, to give you a chance to ask a question back first, <laughs> uh, if you have one. You know, I am taking a look at 14 questions now, and I'm very cognizant that I took up more than my fair share of time. So I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful audience. Okay, wonderful. So uh, Evie, I hand it over to you. You can just go in the order they came in. <laughs> okay. Um, there are so many great questions here. We will start with Linda. She, Linda asks, can you share what is being done now to get the rest of the Afghan collaborators and families and American citizens out of Afghanistan? Yeah, to a certain extent I can, Linda, and that's a great question. Um, and I may have, I, I should have maybe even clarified it in my uh, remarks that although the Department of Defense was very deeply involved in this uh, evacuation, it's the Department of State that really has that role. And um, 
if it exceeds the Department of State's capabilities, which in this part, the Department of State would contract some of those commercial aircraft that I talked about. And because of the threat environment, that was not going to be possible. The Department of the State asked for Department of Defense help. And so we were we were involved uh, in, in that, that surge of getting people out. Now that we have uh, officially left Afghanistan and that last uh, aircraft that departed on the evening of uh, 30 August, uh, it really is back to the Department of State to help work those American citizens that are still in Afghanistan, some of which are there because they did not want to leave. They are because of... Uh, Maybe not everyone in their family would have been able to leave with them. They chose to, to stay behind. But here's the, the critical part of uh, an airport like Harman Karzai uh, staying viable is that after that 30, uh, 30 August date, there have been other uh, American citizens, special interest visa holders that have departed uh, from Afghanistan and and to my knowledge will continue to be able to depart from Afghanistan and again, Department of State um, led process of getting them back to uh, the United States. From the DOD perspective, those 80 plus thousand uh, Afghans that our aircraft brought out and kind of entered into the system in, in countries like uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates and Germany, and for the most part, they have all left those. I think there are still just a few that are left in the Persian Gulf area that are still making their way back to the United States. So that will that will complete uh, the the evacuees that the Department of Defel Defense brought up, but there will continue to be uh, a stream of American citizens uh, able to leave Afghanistan. So. I let you know that it's happening. I can't get you the details just because at this point that is uh, a process that the, the Department of State is running and not the Department of Defense. But thank you for that question, Lynn. Kind of on the similar note, uh, General, um, Gila, our student asks, were the evacuees Afghans who had aided the United States or civilians who had no connection with the US as well? Okay, and so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer a little outside my lane. Um, but uh, I think it's all of the above, Gila. And so certainly uh, American citizens, special interest visa holders, legal permanent residents that have uh, paperwork that showed uh, that they had a, a pathway to America. Uh, and then to your, your next question, yes, on both accounts. There were uh, thousands of Afghans that had helped the United States and its allies uh, while we were operating in Afghanistan. And that, that, um, that help was invaluable uh, to have that local help. And so, yes, the United States wanted to honor that and, and bring those families out. But there was also uh, a category that, um, that I heard the, the president talk about, Afghans at risk. So they, not, they were not necessarily uh, Afghans that had direct connection to helping the United States. But because for 20 years there had been a different environment for uh, certain parts of the Afghan society to flourish, I, I think of females in particular, to have opportunities that potentially was, uh, was going to go away under Taliban rule, that there was a desire of the U.S. government to bring some of those at-risk uh, individuals out uh, as well. So again, I, I don't have uh, precise information on that. That was outside of the scope of, of the Transportation Command, but just uh, from what I'd uh, heard in the meetings and even hearing uh, the president talk, I know that that was kind of the breadth of the population that was brought out uh, on our aircraft. And again, 29 other countries had aircraft uh, that brought out a smaller group of people than the, the United States, but also I think we're doing uh, similar uh, kind of similar demographics of, of Afghans. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Um, well, turning to more of the operation itself, we have a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, how do you train for a people evacuation operation like this of such a huge scale with such a limited timeline? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and so we, the term that we use in the military often, and maybe you see it uh, when you look at military news, is readiness. 
Uh, are we ready? Do we have the equipment that is needed? Do we have the personnel in the quantities that we need them? And do we have the training that is required? And so training, just as I, I mentioned in those days leading up uh, to September 11th, 2001, I was doing training uh, to, to drop uh, soldiers into a, you know, from our airplane in a country. That is not something we do that often, but there have been times in our history where that was needed. And so we train for that. So we have training and we have exercises. And so we can exercise a non-combatant evacuation operation. And so, yes, we do have opportunities to train for that. Um, for the, the, the part of like floor loading uh, individuals, uh, that really is something that uh, we know can be done and we save for contingencies. This was done in, within the United States, like after Katrina, uh, we floor loaded a lot of United States uh, citizens out of Louisiana to other parts of the country because we had to do something in mass. So there are things we train specifically for, and then there are things that we know are within the limits of what our crews and our aircraft are capable of doing. And when needed, leaders can give the authorization that we can do some of those non-standard uh, loading procedures. And so it was very non-standard. Uh, but we start to look at risk and we realize the risk of leaving individuals in that Kabul area uh, versus the risk of having them sitting on the floor of an airplane for, for maybe two hours when they flew to that next intermediate base. The risk of not floor loading uh, was greater than the risk of floor loading. So those are the, kind of the decisions that, that go into uh, that. But yes, there is, there are opportunities that we try to think through the, the full spectrum of things that the military can be called to do. And we, we take opportunities to train or exercise to that, even if it is not uh, something that we're doing commonly on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, kind of following up on that, Hightow asks a great question. What opportunities do you envision data analytics and AI, artificial intelligence, can help improve the efficiency and effectiveness of U.S. military transportation, logistics, and operations? Yeah, um, hi, Dal. That's you're you're looking into our our crystal ball and our future uh, with that question because um, we are not where we need to be yet, uh, and this this operation uh, highlighted that uh, our ability to have what what in the military we call a common operating picture was lacking. Uh, so we were still doing too much communication, person to person, either in a, a video, you know several people like we are right now, you know, on a, on a video screen with several people or, or point to point uh, calls when um, technology uh, would allow that data uh, to be shared almost immediately with everyone to preclude some of those uh, man hour, woman hour events of trying to establish, did we have the right number? What was the number of passengers that came out on that plane? And everyone had that information. So as far as just basic data, uh, usage, uh, we can see immediate improvements we need to make. And um, as far as artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, we are the, the military as a whole is definitely looking into that. Transportation Command is interested in that as well, uh, because it can take a much greater amount of data and at least present potential um, courses of action. Our intent is always, you know, there, there would be a decision maker in the loop, but they have all that, all those options laid out in a much shorter period of time. So uh, if you're asking how much it was involved in the operation, very little, but this operation highlights where uh, we would like to improve in those areas. Great. We have a, a great few questions actually from Jim Craig, who leads UMSL's Veteran Affairs. Um, Jim has a, a couple thoughts here and I'm gonna go ahead and read that. Um, Jim writes, I wonder if you could speak to the non-uniform talent needs that Transcom has. And are you finding that talent in the workforce, workforce excuse me, of the region? Also, if you could identify one or two key competencies that colleges and universities could focus on developing in graduates to address your needs, what would they be? That's from Jim. Okay, thanks, Jim. 
I, I wish I had the number off the top of my head of the percentage of uh, civilians that are at uh, Transportation Command. Um, but it is probably, it may be close to 50%. There's a, there's a, uh, a large population of, of civilians. And I can talk, you know, specifically about Transportation Command, but really, I think generally I can talk larger about the U.S. military. And there is, uh, for instance, as Liana was reading my, my bio, she talked about, you know, 14 moves. And there's, there's a part of uh, officer development, enlisted development that really values uh, a diversity of experience and forces uh, frequent moves to where being in a, a, a job or a location for maybe two to three years is about the maximum time someone is in a location and then they move on to a different location, different job. Um, there's value in that. There's great value in that diversity and, and coming in and, and not getting kind of into a rut of, of, of group think and thinking a certain way. What you lose with that though is some continuity. And so sometimes you may have experienced a new leader comes in, they have an idea and you think, oh, we tried that three years ago and we know that that didn't work. The civilian workforce oftentimes does not move at that same frequency. And so there's great value in the continuity and the depth of, of experience that uh, they bring. And so that's why I think, especially at, at headquarters, uh, combatant commands like transportation command, you will see a, a, a large number and almost a balance of both civilians and, and uniformed uh, personnel. Uh, as you go lower and lower echelons in the organization, uh, the, the you know, down to like a flying unit or a tank unit, you'll see that percentage go much larger to uniform personnel. But so uh, great value uh, and great usage of uh, non-uniform members at Transportation Command. As far as, um, yeah, and yes, for opportunities, uh, I, anyone non-uniform that's interested in, in government work, uh, Transportation Command would be interested in, in having you come out and uh, see if there's your talent would fit with Transportation Command. Your, your, your key competencies piece, um, I kind of in with the last question, cyber, uh, you know, the, 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 the pieces of information technology, uh, there is a, there is a need to accelerate our ability to integrate that into our processes. Um, and so I really think, uh, there's value in, in, uh, skills that capitalize on that, that help decision-making. Um, one of the, one of, uh, our commander's five priorities is advanced decision making. How can we make you know decisions quicker? And it's oftentimes because we can leverage uh, those types of tools. So, um, anyways, Jim, thank you, and thank you for being part of the the, the Veterans Affairs at UMSL. Continuing to get some great questions, we're going to turn to a slightly different topic, General. This is Richard. He writes. Will Scott Air Force Base and Transcom be able to assist the efforts to resettle Afghans in St. Louis and the Metro East? Okay, uh, I don't know what role Scott Air Force Base is gonna have. So a little bit about, if you're not familiar with just Scott Air Force Base. So there is the base itself and um, the unit level of the Air Force that, that usually operates a base is called a wing. And so there's a, a wing, the 375th, Air Mobility Wing, and uh, that commander commands uh, Scott Air Force Base. On this base, there are uh, two commands. There's Transportation Command, there's Air Mobility Command. Both have a four-star general uh, that runs that headquarters. They're not the base commander. There's still a colonel that is the base commander. And so it would be, so I'm not familiar with what role uh, the 375th Airlift Wing has planned to play. Um, so I cannot answer that directly, but I will let you know that from being a, a wing commander myself, both overseas and in the United States, there is a necessary connection with community. The community, it works best when the community embraces the base, uh, even though there's, you know, this transient nature of people coming for maybe two or three years, you know, into your, into your schools and your churches and then leaving. Uh, but communities embracing that. And then the base really turning around and embracing the community and finding a volunteer opportunities to go. And so I know that the 375th 
uh, airlift wing does a lot of community outreach and volunteering. What I don't know is specifically if they have any plans for helping with the, uh, the relocation of, of Afghans in St. Louis, but, um, uh, the wing commander only lives a few houses down from me. So I will, I will, uh, next time I see him, I will mention that we had this opportunity and that question came up. So thank you, Rich. Okay. Uh, Mark writes, what preparation had to happen in order to generate the tremendous number of aircraft for the evacuation? How many bases provided aircraft for the support? So your, your question kind of gets a little bit at the heart of what transportation command does. Uh, the, the four star, in charge of uh, transportation command right now, it's uh, General Jackie Van Ovos. She has what we call operational control of all the C-17s. So even though C-17 aircraft, the 222 are spread around the United States, spread around the world, um, she has kind of ultimate control of where those aircraft are gonna go. And she delegates that authority through me as her director of operations. And so we were able to make aircraft available for whatever the highest priority mission is. It's really kind of the heart of when you hear people talk about command and control. Command and control is taking scarce resources and trying to put them against the highest priority missions. And the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff made it very clear to us this was the highest priority mission on August 13th. And so Transportation Command, the first step was making those aircraft available to our air operations center that does the more uh, tactical, technical piece of actually scheduling a takeoff time, coordinating for diplomatic clearances for countries that a plane has to fly over, or arranging for an air refueling of a tanker aircraft with, with one of the aircraft in order to accelerate um, or medical evacuation with with doctors and nurses on board the plane, uh, which was which was used uh, during this operation. Uh, that command and control, scarce resources against the highest priority mission. So that is what allowed us to to mass uh, C-17s where they were were needed. I do not have the um, uh, the exact number of bases that were used. Uh, however, it's a chance to highlight that. Uh, if you're not familiar with the military, there is an active duty component of the military mm -hmm. that is full time uh, in the military, in the uniform service. And then there is guard uh, and there is Air Force or, or Army Reserves, other other mm -hmm. services. So reserve and guard do not necessarily wear the uniform every day. They may be in this case of, of, of uh, aircraft, they may be airline pilots. Um, they may be uh, working in a hospital. They may be owning a business for most of the time, and then they will come when needed and fly. And I will say that in addition to the active duty uh, bases, uh, whether we're talking about airlift aircraft or air refueling aircraft, there were guard and reserve members that were involved as well. So several bases made aircraft available uh, for this mission. And the C-17 got a lot of uh, publicity because that was on the on the ground at Kabul and on a lot of the, the uh, news footage. But the other aircraft, C-5, were continuing to fly elsewhere in the globe to keep those missions going on. The air refueling aircraft were above uh, refueling fighter aircraft and bomber aircraft, the AWACS airplane that uh, Liana re referenced earlier, uh, aircraft that stay airborne, to uh, to give surveillance and, and be able to mm -hmm. keep kind of a camera on the airfield all at one time. All those aircraft were able to be in the air above Kabul. You know, you never saw them because of air refueling aircraft. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, in my mind, countless number of bases uh, were involved, Mark. So I don't I don't have an exact number uh, for that. But but transportation commands authorities is what uh, made the aircraft initially available to be uh, tactically tasked where they needed to go, uh, where they were needed the most. Thank you. General Norton, you just explained some of the aircrafts very nicely. Uh, and I, as you know, I was like kind of a late comer to the Air Force as a spouse. So I, and I remember your three kids explaining all the air, different types of aircrafts to me when they were very young. And in that uh, regard, we actually have two really interesting technical questions for the, on, uh, on the C-17. 
uh, that I'll summarize. So one of the questions um, is, did any of our C-17 come under fire by the Taliban or any bad actors during the ev evacuation operation? And the second tying in with that, can you describe how the C-17 aircrew aims a pallet of food to land precisely in the right spot on the mountaintop um, so these are two technical questions, I thought. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for the first question, uh, the threat to the aircraft was more from, uh, during that operation, it was more from what we call indirect fire, rockets or mortars that are fired from some position off the airfield uh, onto the airfield. Fortunately, those are relatively imprecise weapons. Uh, and fortunately, uh, there are weapon systems on the airfield that can detect those inbound rockets and mortars and attempt to uh, shoot them down before they get to their target. Um, so more of the threat for this operation was that indirect fire than it was from what would be uh, anti-aircraft artillery uh, fire. So that, that's the first question. For the second question, so there's, there's a few different delivery types. I talked about delivering those uh, food packets on the opening night of, of Operation Enduring Freedom. The intent of that delivery was to spread those 30,000 packages over a large area, two or three miles. And so they were released without parachutes and just released into the air and, and just naturally uh, separated and floated down. That is, that is a, kind of the most basic type of, of drop. But you are correct, there were times where we needed to get either food or ammunition, or water to a precise spot where we wanted to get it to our allies or our forces and not allow a, uh, a Taliban force to have that. And so that is a combination of looking at meteorology, knowing what the winds are, uh, knowing the speed of your aircraft, knowing uh, how fast or slow of the parachute uh, drops. And then also we have some pallets that have global positioning satellite technology that will deliver it to an exact location. So the best way to do it, to, to know you're going to hit a spot is to have some kind of a, a global positioning satellite signal that takes it right to a, a coordinate. Uh, that is relatively new technology. For most of my career, that technology did not exist. And yet, uh, we were able to get uh, pallets within, you know, 50 to 100 meters of the location where we wanted to drop it, just knowing what the winds were, how the parachutes were going to react, what the weight of the, the object we were dropping. So there's a variety of ways uh, to deliver, but uh, the most precise is to use that GPS technology. All right, thank you. Okay. Major General Martin, um, I've got a two-parter here, and I know we're getting close to time here, but uh, maybe there's one of these two prongs you want to go for with this one. Um, what kind of coordination with our NATO allies was involved in the evacuation? And or what do you think some of the biggest lessons learned from this evacuation operation were? Okay, thanks. For the for the coordination with NATO, I can I can talk a little bit operationally. Um, again, I don't I don't have insight into some of the policy pieces. Uh, when we first arrived, when when uh, I mentioned the scenes of of thousands of of Afghans being on the airfield, the Harman Karzai was still under control of uh, of a Turkey of of uh, Turkish forces, um, but soon after that, it transitioned to. Uh, U.S. military control. Uh, we have what we call contingency response forces uh, that have a wide variety of skill sets, and they are actually part of, of Transportation Command. They have uh, background in maintaining aircraft, fixing aircraft, being uh, maintainers. They have background in, in fueling. Some of them have background in air traffic control. And so they controlled the airfield, and I forget what date that that transfer happened, but uh, relatively soon into the operation. So they were not just allowing U.S. aircraft to come in land. They were allowing aircraft of all nations to come on, but there did need to be coordination. There was a limit to the number of parking spots that were uh, available at any one time on the on the field, and so there had to be a coordinated arrival. 
uh, but no way did the U.S. take all of those spots. They made sure that really all nations had an opportunity to come in and uh, uh, bring their personnel out. And Evie, I forget what the second question was. I'm sorry. Can you say it again? Um, oh, so it was the lessons learned. Lessons. I wrote it down. Yeah, I, I, I wrote it down. It was lessons learned. Um, so one, I I, th I think I uh, covered one already that that we're looking at, and that is um, how we can better use um, information technology, a common operating picture, use technology to 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 be able to know uh, what we call kind of in transit visibility that we know how many people are on each plane. We know where each of the planes are. Um, we know where, which locations does Germany have space for more Afghans to come in today, or does Spain have more space for Afghans to come in today? So I think one of the lessons learned is, you know, trying to get more real time, um, uh, awareness uh, of some of that. And the other, uh, I, I think I covered also, but a lesson that I think at Transportation Command we kind of know, but uh, I don't know if outside of Transportation Command it's it's as obvious. A lot of people think that, hey, as long as you have enough C-17s or whatever aircraft you need, you're going to be okay. It's all about just numbers of aircraft and aircrew. We quickly found out it was more than that. It was that it was almost more important to have what we would call a node, some place outside of Afghanistan that we could put the airplane, that we could put uh, the passengers on that aircraft. And so that, um, as you're trying to, you know, have have greater throughput and velocity, oftentimes it's that it's the it's the nodes, it's it's the places and the people with the expertise to keep the planes going. That is what was as important as just having airplanes that were available to show up in uh, Kabul and load up uh, uh, personnel. So I think really, you know, uh, we're, we're doing a larger, what we're calling it, what the military often calls an after action report, where we go back to look to see what went well, uh, what went poorly, and we're working through that. But um, off the top of my head, those are two that uh, I think lessons that uh, came out of the, the operation. Thank you. And we're going to fit in one more here. Uh, more questions we didn't get to. Really good questions. Um, but Manusha writes, would it have been possible to evacuate more civilians if we had started earlier or pushed the deadline to winter? Or would that have put servicemen and women and civilians at greater risk? That's Manusha. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, it's kind of a, another one where it's yes to both. Uh, and even if I don't talk specifically about this operation, uh, in an operation, more time gives you more options usually. And so uh, you can you can either decide to do the same number of things at a slower rate or you can do more in the, the time period. So so oftentimes more time helps. In, in this instance, there is a, a feeling again, I'm, I'm not talking from a position of being part of the policy, but really just somebody that was was able to uh, watch. Uh, the news and see what our, our national leaders, our, our president, our secretary of uh, defense was saying is that um, there was a feeling that at uh, there was a, a period of time that after which there would be more um, more threat to not only uh, the U.S. actors, but the, the Afghans uh, on the airfield. And so, uh, yes, there was a, a consideration of at what point beyond what point would we be incurring more risk uh, or not? Uh, so anyways, yes, time usually is a, a friend. More time allows you more options. Uh, and in this case, uh, we just knew for whatever reason, the policymakers gave us a gave us a deadline. And so as operators, we worked within that policy to maximize uh, the number. And, and there were there were uh, individuals leaving up to that last day of still uh, drawing Afghans out, even as we had to be concerned about drawing our own uh, people and equipment out. Well, in the interest of time, I'm looking at the time here. We're four minutes overdue, um, and uh, I didn't want to overstretch uh, uh, General Martin's time here for sure. I would like to uh, thank the uh, audience, all our participants today for your great, great questions. And if I may, General Martin, I take this as a fantastic introduction into more and hopefully we'll have an opportunity maybe in the spring for a uh, meeting in person with you. Uh, I appreciate your wonderful feedback. And I would like, before I hand it back over to, uh, to Evie for announcing our next uh, speaker event, I would uh, still um, 
like to use the opportunity for a big shout out to our military spouses who help carry the mission. <laughs> and I have seen several here on the call. So hi to all fellow military spouses, especially the ones that uh, um, have husbands that are still in uniform like uh, uh, General Martin here. And I would also like to thank our uh, Chancellor Kristen Sobolik to join us here tonight and all of you for uh, logging on and uh, helping us with this wonderful discussion. Back over to you, Evie. Thank you, Liana. And with that, we'll conclude tonight's program. I too want to thank our speaker, Major General Martin, for joining us along with our audience. And thank you to the University of Missouri St. Louis and UMSL Global for putting on this enlightening event. Um, and as a reminder, we do have another speaker coming up this month as we continue this focus on Afghanistan. Um, you can join us again on Tuesday, November 16, that's next Tuesday, at 7 p.m. as we hear from Paul Costigan. Paul is the Missouri State Refugee Coordinator for the International Institute of St. Louis, and he'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges associated with resettling the Afghan diaspora in St. Louis. So mark your calendars for that upcoming presentation as well. Good night. Good night. Thank you, General Martin. Good night, everybody. Bye, Doctor. Mm -hmm.